But when you put your heart and soul into something and it affects somebody in a way that lifts their spirits, that changes the way they see themselves, then you do become um, bigger than life. You, you are better than you thought you were because you affected somebody else. It's our limiting beliefs that ultimately keep us from becoming the best we're capable of becoming. Something's got to change, but that change has to happen first on the inside. It's time to get unstuck. It's time to get your why back. It's never too late. Let's start today. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Thanks for the download, as always. This is episode 149 of Win Today, and this is your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Well, my friends, today on the show, I am so excited to take a deep dive into the personal story of one of America's most beloved television personalities. He and his team have been instrumental in transforming the lives of families throughout the nation, and it's my privilege to share his own story of overcoming personal struggles and obstacles in order to find success by doing what matters most, and that's helping people. He is Ty Pennington. As a kid, Ty Pennington had too much energy. He was chaotic, bouncing off the walls, and on a first-name basis with the local emergency room staff. You see, back then there wasn't public awareness of attention deficit disorder yet. So people just thought Ty was rambunctious and, truth be told, a troublemaker. But Ty discovered something unbelievable when he was just a boy. He felt most focused when he was building something. He discovered that he loved to work with his hands, to use tools and be creative to build and design new things. So in today's conversation, Ty shares his remarkable life story in which he remembers when he was diagnosed with ADHD in college and what it has meant to be an advocate for ADHD awareness. You'll hear about his start as a model and a carpenter and his eventual move to television where he starred in two of America's most popular television shows. I really believe through Ty's own story that today you're going to learn how to navigate obstacles when they get in your path, how to get out of your own way, and how to position yourself for success. Right now, here's the conversation with Ty Pennington. Hey, Ty, welcome to the conversation. This is huge. I'm so glad you're here. I am so glad I'm here. This is awesome. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. Well, Ty, let's dive in. Millions and millions of people met you every Sunday night on Extreme Makeover Home Edition. But what they may not know is that you've sort of thrived on embracing a chaotic life, even from a young age. I'd love to start there and ask you to take us back into your childhood. What was it like? Well, um, you know, as the the book will tell you, it <laughs> it uh, even when... You start reading the book. I I wanted to to sort of really sort of show you what the mind of somebody with ADHD was like. And so literally when I was writing the book, I I told the uh, publishers what I wanted to do is be able to jump from one chapter to the other, just just the way anybody talking with ADHD does. And I think um, for me, like you literally start in the chaotic moment of me in a classroom. So my mom was going – um, was studying to be a child psychologist and went to uh, my elementary school to test the worst kid they had. And they were like, Mrs. Pennington, I don't think you know who that is. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think every day I was really sort of um, uncontrollable in the sense that, like, I mean, literally I was observed, like, stripping naked, wearing my desk, throwing erasers, like, climbing in and out of the windows. So I was just constantly distracting, I guess, everyone. Mm. Uh, and the chances were, probably were because I wasn't soaking in the knowledge that everybody else was. And since I couldn't retain it because I couldn't focus long enough to get it, that I wanted to create the chaos so that nobody else could learn in the process. So I, I ended up spending a lot of time in the hallway of, uh, of school or in the principal's office. But, um, I mean, I guess the good news is that my mom was trying to be a child psychologist. So she, you know, made me do a bunch of tests, uh, you know, and luckily, um, as she says, you know, my verbal skills weren't high, but I talked a lot. But uh, <laughs> anyway, she's, basically, there's a quote that she says that, like, listening to me was like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. But luckily, she was patient enough that um, 
So I had to take all these different tests and, and there's these visual memory tests that, you know, you have like these geometric puzzles that, that all of these different shapes and create this one image. And then they, you know, she'd mess them up and flip them over and all kinds of things. Well, I guess I was really good at it cause I, I recreated it in like seven seconds, like, uh, you know, five times in a row. So, uh, that showed that like, you know, the right side of my brain was actually firing pretty well. Um, and I think the importance of this is anybody with ADHD or let's just say hyperactive, um, you sort of get lost in the shovel of the people thinking you have sort of a mental disorder. And so they put you on medication, they do this, um, or they just put you out in the hallway like with me. Cause I didn't even get diagnosed until I was literally starting college. But, um, but I think the importance of what, uh, you sort of go through that is that you find something that you're good at. And for me, the only thing that would ever calm me down is when I was doing something creative, like drawing or building something with my hands. So it makes sense that, you know, eventually I would end up somehow finding a career that um, I could either use that energy creatively or I end up building something. I, I just wouldn't guess that I would build a house in seven days, but I did build a tree house in one day, which is pretty good. So all of this is happening then, Ty. Were you confused? Were you frustrated? What was going on inside your head? Yeah, I think I was definitely um, frustrated because nobody wants to be the the kid that won. Everyone is not only doing tests on, but I mean, at, at one point I had to do this token economy thing where you literally had to take this this card that said whether or not your your conduct was good, whether or not your class participation was good, whether or not your uh, all these different things. And so, uh, as my mom called it, it was called the to- token economy system. And if I got all the boxes checked. That, which means like I was a good boy, then uh, you know, at the end of the day or the end of the week, if I filled out all the boxes, that I would get a prize. But my mom kept going back into the closet to uh, get a prize, so it didn't take me too long to figure out where all the prizes were being stored. Mm. And, once I found, and once I found the bag, well, that whole token economy system sort of went out the window. But, um, but yeah, it was frustrating because, to be honest with you, it's hard to – look, one of the, the main struggles with ADHD is um, communication. So you no, no, you you not only have a tough time sort of expressing yourself anyway. So when someone's asking you, like you know, what do you think the problem is? You don't know because you don't know how to express it. But uh, you you sort of express it physically is what I'm guessing, and that's probably what I've always done is physically express things, mm-hmm. whether it be you know breaking something or uh, sticking my foot in the fan when I wanted a cookie, which I still think is a phenomenal uh again creating <laughs> chaos yeah so but yeah and even on the show you know on extreme like if there wasn't enough noise happening like i would make them turn on even more generators because i wanted to be shouting because it sounds more energetic um yes. so but i think you know let's face it parents that are raising kids with adhd that or anything like me have to have one thing and that's called patience. They also have to have a door that they can say, take it outside. Because if you have to live inside with someone like that, you're going to lose your mind. Um, mm. So yeah, my mom would like make me run around the house like six or seven times just to like wear me out, um, which was always a good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to take the story even deeper, Ty. I want to go into a statement from your book that really captivated me when I was doing show prep. And you wrote this. You're, you're talking about your time in the hallway and you wrote this. It's the reason I'm causing all that chaos in the first place, because nothing I'm hearing in the class or reading in books is actually sticking inside my head. So how did you cope, Ty? Well, that's a good question. Um, you have to remember too, I didn't really even get diagnosed till I was already out of high school. Um, mm. And so I think the only way I coped is that I had a pretty good support system at home. Like my mom would be like, well, I, I guess I'd look at it this way. I didn't really, um, didn't really do well in certain classes, but I did well in other situations. Like with there's ever a creative project um, in any of the, the classes I was taking, that was a visual I would do really well in. Um, and I think my mom would, you know, set up, you know, projects that I would do on the kitchen table that I would do really well. And so I would feel a little bit of success in that, but yeah, it it wasn't a lot of fun because when you're sort of failing at something, you're not excited to be going to school. And that's why a lot of people drop out because they're Mm. like, "Eh, it's not really a great time for me because I'm not doing well. So it's, it's different when you're really into it and you're understanding what's happening and you're engaged and you want to learn more. But in my case, it was just, I just couldn't really catch up because I was constantly, that's what's interesting about even reading my own book. Like you would think, you know, if you read one paragraph, sometimes you have to start over and read that, that next paragraph. But once I figured that out, what I I did was I started drawing pictures of what was happening. Say I was, I was learning world history. Um, and so I'd start drawing pictures of 
whatever the the country was, uh, whatever treaty was, that kind of thing. And once I saw the visual images that I drew next to the story, that would help me remember when I had a test on the names of the people, the town that the treaty was signed in, etc. Wow. But all of that is so – yeah, because you have to because it all runs – together words just become one long sentence even when i'm you know clearly uh when i speak they all become one sentence but thanks to my mom she turned me on to things like periods and commas but yeah uh (laughs) so yeah i I think that's what it was is i had to use the visuals to stimulate the memory because words just wouldn't do it yeah oh absolutely how how was the interaction with people then i mean in other words how did you how did people relate to you did you did you feel like you were um for lack of a better term like an experiment under someone's thumb all the time because of the things happening inside your world, you know, constant supervision. Did you feel like you were at principals and teachers whim, like you were their experiment? Yeah. I think the confusing thing is that, I mean, I I wasn't a bad kid. I mean, I really was a good kid. Mm. I was just like really energetic. No, I didn't really know what to do with the energy. And so, um, I was sort of just like spontaneous combust. I couldn't really sit still that long without doing something. It's just, uh, as one, um, as one psychiatrist I, I met with later on in life said, have you ever thought about not doing? And I was like, no, no, I haven't. <laughs> I literally do. That's what I do. But I think that the, you know, the, the tough part is that you, you know that you're not a bad kid. You just seem to be always in detention. You always seem to be grounded. You always seem to be being punished for something that you know is not really horrific. It's not mm. like, you know, making a mistake of actually burning a, a forest down. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the struggle is you, you, you're not really sure why you're, you're, um, you're always the one that's in trouble, you know? Um, and it's also the easiest one to blame. I'm sure my brother would just point at me be like, how'd the window get broken? He did it. So, uh, you, you sort of get used to those obstacles and you have to figure out a way to, um, but look, I think one of the most important things that happened in my life was me being kicked out of the house for my family because for the first time, not only did I have to find a way to believe myself, but I started meeting people I didn't know that had no idea about my past history. So I could literally sort of become a, a new story, a new, uh, a new beginning. And, um, and of course, that's when I put myself through art school. And, and, when, and all of a sudden then, people really started to see a side of me that no one had seen yet, which is a really creative side, which I started winning awards and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is completely different than your parents uh, freaking out when you're mowing the lawn because they think they're going to cut your foot off. So, you know, the confidence is the, is the real problem with ADHD is you, you, you the lack of confidence and uh, you have to find something that you're good at. And that's why I tell parents all the time, whatever they seem to be doing that's calming them down, figure out a way that they end up doing something like that for a living because that's, that's what you want. Chances are most people these days are looking at video games. So hopefully that's not the case. But for me, that was never, that was never even an option because, you know, I'm from that era, that pre video game era. I mean, we had the arcades, but you had to go there. Yeah. I talk about your relationship with your mom and then even your biological father. What was that like? Well, my relationship with my mom um, has always been, you know, good. She's, I think uh, she's the ultimate, let's face it, any single mother, um, you know, raising two kids, going to school um, full time and working, um, you know, at night uh, as well. Anybody who's had to do that is the ultimate do it yourself. I mean, that's, you know, raising a family. But um, but no, it's not to say that I didn't have a father figure in my life. Like, you know, I had a stepdad, which was great. Um, but it's not the same as like a biological father because um, – with a biological father, they're going to stand up and be like, instead of just saying, go ask your mother, go ask your mother, you know, when you're, when you're asking to do something, they literally will put their fist down. It's a totally different vibe because, you know, let's face it, when you, when you sign up to sort of join a family that's already got a, a, a mother with two kids, you're going to be sort of second fiddle when it comes to authority. Um, and, you know, that's, um, that's, a, that's a huge sacrifice, and I'm, I'm stoked that my dad would actually have the courage to do that because I don't know if I have that ability because I'm such a control freak. I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't sit on the sidelines. But, um, but for me, it was definitely uh, – I, I think in many ways my mom was constantly working, and so um, to be completely honest, like my brother and I kind of had to raise ourselves um, – and that's why we started like learning to cook at such an early age because um, my mom would be working late and 
So, but she was smart enough to teach us how to like, you know, start doing chores, et cetera. But we started cooking and, and things like that at an early age because we were literally left alone quite a bit. Um, because that's just the way life is, you know, when you've got to, you've got a parent that's got to work full time. So, um, I think the relationship with a father figure has always been uh, a bit of a strain with me because I question why I should, you know, listen to anyone that's not necessarily my, there's just something about that, that that I've always questioned authority. And when you question authority, you really end up getting in trouble because you, you know, authority always wins. Um, but, um, but luckily I did go visit my real dad um, at the age of like 15 and, and learned like who he was and, and what a character he kind of was, which was great because he really did. Um, not only was he a talented musician, but he also worked really well with his hands and built like two story tree houses for people uh, to match their houses. And he was great. And we actually built a boat um, over the time that I visited him. Uh, and of course, that boat sank, which I think is really apropos, which. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is I got to know the guy that my DNA is from. Um, but I also realized um that I'm probably better off have not living with that human being. Like my mom definitely made the right choice. I'm guessing if there's a, you know, because you, when you're in your, your late teens, you start rebelling against like whoever you're living with. I just, I, I, wanted, I rebelled against everybody. And so, you know, I was questioning where I should be living, who I should be listening to, but it was really good to meet that, that, um, that father because um, I realized, you know, I'm definitely probably better off um, you know, with the, the situation with my mom, et cetera. Um, because you know, she's, uh, well, she's just a better parent. Let's just face it. That's, that's what moms usually are. So, um, anyway, uh, but yeah, do I have daddy issues? Probably. But, um, I think in a, in a weird way, when it comes to success, most of the people that I have met, um, that are really incredibly successful, I make a joke and I'm like, who are you trying to prove to the world, the world that you, uh, are gifted and uh, they just looked at me like what um, but the truth of it is it's usually they're trying to prove it to somebody and uh, and I think sometimes because of those issues you work harder at achieving because you've got something to prove maybe because um, uh, and I think sometimes that's that's the, the so the father figure issue that you're trying to prove to uh, in my case um, it was certainly a surprise uh, for any of them to see the success that I had especially since we thought I was going to lose a foot mowing a lawn uh, con you know, considering I work with power tools and could have lost a finger at any given moment. And to this day, I still have all my phalanges. So I would call that success. Yeah. That's a powerful learning, Ty, that you just shared. And it leads me to ask then, what was the pivotal shift? If we can fast forward in your life, then what was the pivotal shift in your life then that set the stage for your career and helping people in the way you're doing now? I think the, um, the real big shift was two things. One, um, I had a car wreck. I flipped the Jeep like seven times and ended up, um, well, walking away, which is crazy uh, because the, the Jeep literally flipped and I think it landed on me as well. But uh, I lost a bunch of skin uh, and I cracked my head open the whole nine yards, but I was still in the fashion industry, which is kind of funny, just the fact that I was in the fashion industry, but um, because I really didn't work that much anyway, but I just got in the cover of J. Crew, which means the phone finally started ringing off the hook. But because of the Jeep wreck, um, and because of the scar tissue and because uh, one of the clients saw staples in my head, basically the work started tapering off because, you know, um, the wounds. But more importantly, my brother left my portfolio in his car, which basically was broken into. And so any proof of, of, um, of the fact that I was in that industry was stolen and, and pretty much used for toilet paper uh, in a, a really tough part of Atlanta, which I think is kind of hilarious because if that didn't happen – I would have continued probably down that path uh, a little longer, which, which it needed to be ended. It needed to be cut off. So because of that ending and I had no book to actually go out on, on auditions, I went back to construction and building and I started building high end furniture and I started working for a bunch of different clients. And then literally two years later, I get uh, a call from my old agency like, hey, I know you're totally out of the business. I know you're doing construction, but there's an audition where they're looking for a carpenter who's kind of sarcastic. And I was like, well, I'm half of that. So uh, I, went on this, I went on this audition and, um, and uh, Frank Bilek was there and he asked me um, what my name was. He's like, uh, and I'm like, he goes, well, why don't you build me a box? And uh, I could tell by the other materials there that people had tried to to you know, build a flower box for him. 
But instead, I started measuring his height and started building him a coffin. So the cameraman just started laughing hysterically because he knew I was literally building him a coffin. So I guess in that moment, um, I realized that I didn't even care if I got that job because I had a kitchen I had to finish for a real client. And I think the pivotal point was <clears throat> I got to a point in my life where <clears throat> I could no longer wait for another person's a, a decision on whether or not I worked. I had to be in control on whether or not I got a job. But at that, so I'd given up on that other industry. But at that very moment of giving up, the last audition I go on, I literally show an attitude like I don't care if I get this or not because I have something I have to finish already. But I think that was exactly the attitude they were looking for, for the character to play in, in Trading Spaces. And so because of that, I ended up getting the role that changed my life because next thing I know, I was a household name. And that show, of course, led to um, – Extreme Makeover Home Edition, which, uh, thank God, made people cry for the right reasons instead of the wrong reasons, which is like, what have you done to my kitchen? So, yeah, um, I, think there are, I think there are certain things that happen in all of our lives that really are tectonic shifts that really change the direction, the momentum of where you're going. Um, but a little bit of luck happens as well. Like if I hadn't um, been in, in, in Atlanta to – to hear about an audition that was happening in Tennessee. If I'd been to California at that time, I would have never gotten that. So it's just interesting that you, I was at the right place at the right time, but I also had the exact amount of experience in about three different areas that was exactly with what they were looking for. They actually didn't realize how much I knew about uh, furniture making. I think they were just looking for anybody who had a personality. Mm. Ty, in your book, you wrote, what you need to learn about life is that sometimes you have to get rid of the big obstacle right in front of you in order to see the future waiting for you, a future with an outcome that's different from what you first expected. What was the biggest obstacle in your way? Well, I, I mean, look, there are so many obstacles that we, we face every day. The biggest obstacle that everyone faces is themselves. We can't seem to get out of the way of ourselves. And what I mean by that is um, we either we either find a way to procrastinate uh, about making a decision to take a, you know, a leap of faith and try something that um, you think you'd be good at, but you just don't know. A lot of times you, you, we try and stay safe, which is like, oh, um, I know I'm not getting paid as much as I should. I know I'm, I'm not... Um, you know, I, I'm not valued as much as I should at this job, but at least it's paying the bills. But at some point, you have to make a decision of, of whether or not you want to take a gamble and go for something that um, you've never done before. But I think when you go down, when you open up a door and you go down a, an avenue, you've never done something before. You learn not only something new, but you learn um, something about yourself that you can adjust. You can, you can drive on a different terrain. You can work in different environments. You can, um, not only that, uh, achieve more than you thought. And it's okay to fail because that's the best way way to learn anything. Mm. It's okay to fail because that's the best way to learn anything. Ty, that's so rich. I'd love to know the backstory on extreme. How did the show come to be? Well, the popularity of training spaces got really big, and I knew it got big because um, one day I was in Orlando working on the show, and these tattooed lowrider uh, bicycle dudes pulled up and were like, hey, man, you're Ty, bro. And I was like, uh, yeah. And I was like, how are you guys? How do you know my name? And they're like, oh, we love the show. We watch it every day at 4. So uh, I was just amazed at a show that was on during the day at like 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I found that amazing that the show got that popular. I mean, it really did. It, it, it broke all cable ratings, which was just crazy. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I was only on half the shows. And so um, it got to the point that I couldn't even afford to keep doing the show because I wasn't paid that much on the show. And so because I got so busy with TV, all my other clients went away. Um, so now I'm not making as much as I thought because I'm only working half the show. So long story short, I tried to get a raise, but I couldn't get a raise. So I said, well, why don't you guys put me on some of the other shows you have on TLC and I could just do several shows at the same time. And they're like, well, no, we'd like you right where you are. So I realized then that they're not going to promote me. They're not going like, to give me any more chances. So I had to make a decision and, um, to leave the show, which is really hard. It was the best I mean, it's the best job I've ever been given. Literally, people said to me, how did you get a job being you? And I'm like, 
well, I guess I'm qualified. But um, <laughs> to walk away to walk away from something like that, like, is really hard. Like, I literally was kicking myself at night, and which is um, which is really hard to do. But I practiced really hard and figured out a way to kick myself. Um, you have to use the back of your heel anyway. Um, so, uh, so I ended up having a meeting in California because um, there was a lady who was. Um, well, long story short, this company called Inamal put me under contract um, because they wanted to do a show with me. They just didn't know what what show it would be yet. So we had creative meetings about what we wanted to do. I actually told them I wanted to build three story tree houses for Make a Wish kids, um, and they told me that's that's wonderful, but um, nobody really wants to see that kind of sappy television because at the time you have to remember. Uh, Shows that were really popular were like Survivor, where people argued and battled each other to, to survive on an island. So um, so we ended up having different creative meetings. I got a call one day, and they're like, we have the show. It's going to be you and like six other designers, and you build a house in a week. What do you think? I'm like, well, I think it's impossible, but that sounds like it could be an awesome television show. Um, and then, of course, they asked me uh, the most fearful question ever, which is, how much do you think that would cost? And I'm like really uh anyway from 200,000 to 2 million all depending on where and how big so um yeah i think i think what was really amazing about extreme is that it was set out to be one thing because they literally cast people that would argue and not get along and the uh the show found its own identity because between myself and some of the other designers like the show ended up literally doing a 180 from what it was designed to be and you realize that well we all realized that during the process of building a house for a family that had the ugliest house in the neighborhood that it wasn't our story that was important it was the family story like why is their house the ugliest in the neighborhood it's because their daughter was fighting cancer and all the money yeah. there they they're saying it was going to the treatment and then once we realized that that was the story i looked to my producer and i was like please tell me um that this is the direction the show is going to go and he's like I'm thinking it is. And I was like, wow, that'd be awesome because I'd like to do this again. And, uh, and literally right out of the gate, it was one of the most amazing moments, to be honest with you, seeing all the neighbors come out, seeing everybody in blue T-shirts crying. I knew then that this show could be like monumental. It, and it only got better um, as it, it progressed, as, as we went on. And, and, and as you know, at some point, we were in Joplin, Missouri, building seven houses in seven days for seven families that had been devastated by um, a tornado that literally wiped away an entire town. And that's when you know you're on something that is having an impact on, on, on the world when you're affecting that many families in an entire community. But more importantly, even when you leave, those same people want to work on another project. They want to build a, a ramp for a veteran. They want to build a park for kids. They, they're inspired because they, they look – they felt the positivity of working together and doing something really amazing in their community. And I think that is really when you realize you've, you've, you've not only become successful, but you've changed sort of your own view of, of yourself because you've had an impact on somebody else's life. But at the same time, it's those people you're working with and for that are impacting your life in a way that affects you for the rest of your life. Because um, you meet people that, that um, change the way you not only – look at yourself but also what you look at as an artist um to be actually good work anybody can make a painting that's colorful that looks great on a wall but when you put your heart and soul into something and it affects somebody in a way that lifts their spirits that changes the way they see themselves um and also turns a page that they couldn't turn in the story of their own in their own life then you do become um bigger than life you you are better than you thought you were because you affected somebody else Oh, yeah. And, and Ty, I want to stay there because I want to dig a little deeper into that and ask, even on an extreme, that while you were transforming people's homes, based upon what you just said, I believe you were actually using that transformation, that physical transformation to reach inside their heart and give them an opportunity to hope again. Is that correct? And what, what drives you in that space? Well, I think that's that's exactly what it is, is that I think once you feel the gratification um, of seeing what it looks like, seeing what change looks like. And what I mean, powerful change, like when the bus moved and you saw people screaming at the sky, pounding the earth, running up and down the street, doing somersaults, high-fiving hundreds and hundreds of people. When you see that reaction, there's no way you can't get addicted to wanting to do that again. But, um, and that's what it was. I mean, 
you wanted absolutely to, to feel that again. Um, and for me, like I wouldn't just look over at the builders or the people that, that, that work nonstop. I also worked at the people that nobody um, would ever know were, were part of it. The people in blue t-shirts who, who came for four hours and stayed for four days um, who like didn't even know the family that they were helping. They just rolled up their sleeves and wanted to pitch in to do something positive. Um, and that's when you realize you're really working and you're really doing something that um, is not like anything you can find anywhere. It's so special it, that kind of like real positive energy doesn't doesn't exist um, every day, every place, um, anywhere. You, it really it happens because people with warm hearts want to make a positive change, and so um, yeah, it, it's it's unbelievable. It's like a it's like the best feeling you could ever have, and of course you're physically exhausted. But even some of the contractors and builders that didn't sleep for like eight days would literally say, you know what, we want to do this again. I was like, you're insane. <laughs> but it's true. Like there's something about it that you just want to do again. Um, and I think that's that was the appeal of the show is that, I mean, as somebody once told me, um, what I love about Extreme is it makes you excited to go to work on Monday because you want to go make a positive change. You want to go do something that um, makes a positive difference. And even if it's just um, – helping out somebody, you know, in the lunchroom of a school, you're just, you want to make a difference. And I was like, wow, that's the coolest thing anyone's ever said about the show. Mm, yeah, for sure. Ty, there's a moment from your very first extreme show that you wrote that you'll never forget. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, well one of the key things is, is, um, on the first episode, actually the bus didn't move because we were, um, we were all basically living on that bus and it was parked in front of the house. But when we brought the family back, we realized the bus is a good way to block the view of the house. So we had them stand behind the bus. And it was actually uh, – we actually walked the family around the bus. Of course, somebody later on had the brilliant idea of moving the bus, and that certainly stuck. But I think what was really amazing about that first episode is that this family had known me on television for redoing one room in their house from Trading Spaces. They didn't even realize we were doing their entire house. And then they walked around the bus and they saw all the physical changes to the exterior and they realized, oh my God, it's, it's a different house. Um, and in that moment, they had this huge reaction that I'd never seen before because, I mean, this is a family that's been battling you know, cancer with one of their children. So they didn't think anything would ever happen like this to them in any way. But then our, our two contractors, I look over and there's tears just streaming down their face. I look at the blue t-shirts of volunteers uh, again, tears are streaming down their face and you're realizing, oh my God, this is, uh, this is not just building a house in seven days. This is life changing television. And in that moment I realized this is probably, um, like the greatest feeling you could ever have. And that's when I looked at my producer and said, we have to do this again. And he's like, I completely agree. Mm. Ty, I want to swing back from that, back to the day you received your ADHD diagnosis. How did it feel to receive a conclusive diagnosis after years of just kind of navigating through this? Well, I wasn't excited uh, when my mom said, look, we're going to go have your brain checked out to see what's wrong with you. Nobody's excited about that. But I met this guy, and I'll never never forget these comfortable slippers he had. He had a, I, I'm not a loafers guy, but he had these little knobbies mm -hmm. on the bottom of them. But anyway... Um, but he sits me down and he, he literally puts out like six different types of things to eat. There's peanuts, there's chocolate, there's cheese. Basically, there's sweets and then there's protein. And so he's having me hold a conversation with him and asking me to eat these different things while I'm talking to him. And he could tell immediately when I was focused and when I wasn't focused because of what's going into my system and how that sugar is affecting my bloodstream and whether or not the dopamine is being released out of my brain. So he turns to my mom and says, wow, this kid is classic to the letter ADHD. I've never seen it higher in anyone. Um, and so my mom was like, I knew it. He based his theory on the fact that it went all the way back to caveman, that there's, there's the farmer caveman and then there's the hunter caveman. And the hunter caveman, of course, will go out and kill whatever it needs to eat for a while. And then it'll lay around its cave and eat until it runs out of food. And then it realizes it has to go find something else. The hunter gets up every day you know, by the sun, make sure he puts in a hard day's work so that everything is constantly on schedule so he doesn't um, – 
So he's ready for the rains, he's ready for the sun, he's ready for the harvest. Uh, people with ADHD are never ready for things like that. They can't have that much struggle. They, they don't have that kind of structure or that kind of um, planning in their life. That's why it's really great if they find someone like that in their life. Uh, but I like the fact that the doctor was explaining that it went all the way back in his mind, he thought, to um, you know, ancient man. But his 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 plan, his idea was that we could uh, we could try and control it by by our diet, which makes complete sense. The only problem is, is if you fall off your diet, then of course you're no longer organized enough to stay on your diet. And with ADHD, that becomes a serious problem right off the bat. And that's why he suggested these certain medications that release the dopamine in your brain. Long story short, I walked into that office expecting, I don't know what, but I didn't want to hear that I had a mental problem. I walked out and realized there's a dude who's intelligent beyond all recognition who told me he has the same condition I do. And he goes, you just have to learn how to control it. And I'm like, wow. So I ended up being diagnosed and prescribed a little bit of medication within literally a week. Um, I ended up getting higher grades and more importantly, I was on a soccer team and I literally went from sitting the bench to scoring hat tricks because I could read the field. I could see where the ball was going to be. I could anticipate a play and people were like, man, what's happened to you? And I'm like, well, I got my focus ring back. So it was like literally putting a lens on a camera for the first time in my life. Um, and it, uh, it changed not only the way I think my brain worked, but it it also changed the way I think I, I, I thought about myself. I realized that at that point I was running on – I hadn't even been running at a full engine. I had been – I didn't even realize how the engine worked. And I think with – after that conversation, I realized that you know the brain is um, – it's a muscle that – it's an instrument that you, you have to run the right, the right ingredients through to make it run right, and, uh, which really helped a lot. I mean if you can imagine – if since the age of four, you're being told you, you know, you've got issues, you've got problems. And then finally you're at 17 and you're like, look, there's other people that have the same condition. There is a way you can treat it. Next thing you know, um, you know, I've figured out a way to put myself through art school and, uh, I'm, I'm turning in three projects instead of one because I'm realizing it could be better than the first one I did because I'm, I literally become an overachiever. So uh, that hadn't happened before. So yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book because I want parents to understand that um, like getting diagnosed and putting your kids on, on certain medications, a lot of people think that's, you know, that's the wrong thing to do. In my case, I think it's the, it was the, absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and because it was such small doses, and, and my personality didn't change. It's not like I became so serious. I was still that fun, crazy person who would jump off a building. But now I would at least think before I jumped off the building. I was like, well, we may want to go ahead and EMS standing by. So, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I mean. It's like you, uh, you're still that fun, creative person, but your brain is finally firing on all cylinders, which up until that point, it was sputtering at best. Mm. What do you wish more people understood then about ADHD? Well, I think what I want more people to understand about ADHD is that I think it's – there's two things that are happening. I think everybody thinks they have it, and I also think some people don't realize how serious it is. So it's, it's literally – on the ends of both spectrums because I think a lot of people think they have it. And so a lot of people are getting their kids medicated on it, but you have to remember there's ADD and there's ADHD and ADHD. Um, here's how you, you can tell this child has it. You have to look at the school records. And if you see, if you see their conduct, you see their grades have literally been like hitting valleys. We're talking about really low grades in certain areas, but then also spikes in others. Then, that's a sign that you've got not only ADHD, but you've got behavioral issues, which is exactly what ADHD is because you're distracted. You've got hyperactivity, distractibility, um, and something else I can't remember, which is just hyper. Um, and back then, they didn't even have medication for it, so they would put me on Benadryl, which would just make me drowsy and basically oh, drool wow. all over the place. So I think the thing about what I realized is that you, know, you become the class clown, and the thing about that is, is when you're no longer fun – People miss that, so they, they will literally like throw things at you to make you be that fun guy again. So I had to constantly change high schools um, 
so that I could get my grades going again until I became popular. And then people realized I was a little bit crazy and they were like, Oh, you got to push this kid's buttons. You know, he's a, he's a lot of fun once he get riled up, but that's just it. You know, you get known as being sort of the entertainer and uh, let's face it. I got lucky. I found an outlet um, as my, as my shrink used to say, because I owed him so much money that I had to start painting his house to pay off my debt. Oh, <laughs> he's wow. like, you're so, you're so creative, Ty. When are we going to find an outlet for you? I'm like, I don't know. And luckily, I got an audition for Trading Spaces and things changed. But, but there's other people out there just like me that have those same issues that are fun, they're creative, but they don't have that outlet to, to find the success. But there are people that find a way. And I think you just have to believe in yourself and find that one thing that you, you are better at than uh, you thought you were. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's how you make people feel so good. Um, what would you want people who are listening right now to know about hopelessness in their own situation and where to begin to regain a foothold on life again? Well, it's tough. Um, I think all of us and even the people that have success find moments of, of hopelessness. I mean, look, sadness comes in um, at, at times in our lives even in our happiest moments, you, you can have these random weird, you know, days where you just don't feel great about yourself or, or, or your life or your relationship or where you're going or, or, um, you know, God forbid, or also, uh, you know, later on in life and like what's happening to your mind, et cetera. But I think the most important message anyone can give to anyone is, um, it's the simple one, which is tomorrow's another day. Like, like, like whatever is bothering you today it may not be there tomorrow. I mean, it's not like the problem is going to go away, but there's a reason to believe that things are going to get better. Uh, and I think with ADHD, a lot of people find um, they just can't find that one thing that I guess makes, makes people feel proud of themselves. They can't find that one thing that people are like, wow, you're really good at something. And that's my message is that don't give up on, on, on yourself. Know that you have a gift. Know that you have a talent. And sometimes you have to get away from the people that are closest to you so that you create a new identity, so that you actually have a chance to, to, um, to like prove to yourself and to, to the people that may even know you best that you are different than what they thought. And I think mm. that's the thing is sometimes we all – we get pigeonholed into this person is like this, this person is like that. They're never going to be able to do this. They're never going to be able to do that. That's not true. Um, because you can truly be whoever you want to be. It's all about the opportunities that you have and just know that and my other advice is to literally go down any opportunity door that opens, even if it doesn't seem like it's right for you. You never know how you're going to use the skills you learn from that particular door. Um, it's going to come in handy in some way or another down the road. And besides, it all comes down to experience. In the end, what everybody is looking for is experience and that's why you've got to live as much as you can because that's the only way you learn anything is making as many mistakes as you possibly can and i've done that a lot well ty everything we talk about here on the show is about the pursuit of wholeness from the inside out and you've touched on that in such a great way today um what's one of your regular habits or, or daily rhythm practices that lead you to wholeness in your own life what does that look like for you um well i try and um I try and exercise. I really do. That that helps me a lot. Um, and then I also go in and I scream into a closet. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess for me, um, honestly, like my strength probably comes from uh, being around family uh, because it's a support system. And um, and it's funny, you know, life has come full circle. So for me, I'm sort of taking care of my mom when I can now. Um, and I'm just sort of looking at um, how important it is is to have people that you love in your life because at some point we're all going to really need help. It's just called time. Uh, and, and I think for me, like it's it literally the thing that brings me the, the most joy every day is being around family. And I think we all need some of that in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Well, last question, Ty. I mean, you're in the process of rebooting Trading Spaces with TLC. How's that process been? What's, what's going on? What's ahead? Oh my God, it's been so much fun. Um, so I don't know if you, you know, but I, uh, and that's what's kind of funny about the book, right? Because as I'm re writing the book, I'm explaining, I'm also doing trading spaces in a show called while you're out at the same time. Um, but just last week, um, on trading spaces, which comes on at 8 PM on Saturday on TLC, 
I, uh, I did a country sort of farm style um, design and uh, for an awesome, awesome couple who love country music. And as you guys know, the, the farm country style design has been hugely popular. Everybody's doing it. Um, but I'm not ne necessarily, you know, uh, known for that. I'm probably known more for a little bit of a modern style, but I do country pretty well. But they wanted an extreme episode. They really wanted it to go, um, I don't know, just be bigger and better than their other episodes or something. And I said, oh, we can definitely do that. And so, um, so not only did I build like this really awesome bed and basically made a headboard out of um, uh, screen doors um, and, you know, put two guitars in there, which was really turned out, the room really turned out beautiful, but it needed one final touch. So um, I know the family really loves country. And so I realized that what's country without farms and what's the farm without farm animals. So I literally put live goats and chickens in their bedroom as they, we did the reveal. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and oh so let's just say, uh, they, they really left their mark on the bedspread. So it was amazing. Oh, um, they, oh my God. It was, it was awesome. Like they literally loved the room and they actually were holding and kissing the goats. So they actually loved the farm animals as well. But that's, that is the joy and chaos and crazy that I bring to trading spaces, which was, uh, it's just a lot of fun. So we've still got a bunch of episodes we're doing and, and, uh, I love it. It's, it's awesome. Those guys are my first family. So it's so much fun working with everybody again. Oh, Ty, that's so cool. Well, listen, this conversation has been so much fun, but before I let you go, I want to ask, is there anything we haven't talked about today that you would really just love to leave with the listeners? You know, I think the only thing I, I would leave you guys with is that, um, you know, it's belief. Just believe um, in yourself because a lot of times um, it's not everybody's going to believe in you, but the people that do believe in you are going to make such a huge difference in your life because that's all that matters is that remember the people that believed in you and said, um, you know what? I think you can do this because those people are the ones that change you. And it, sometimes it takes other people to believe in you before you believe in yourself. And for me, um, I think my mom has always believed in me. She knew I'd be able to do something. Um, and, you know, of course, it would be breaking something first. But she knew that I was going to do something with my hands um, that would hopefully be positive instead of negative. But uh, I think that belief led me to believe in myself as well. And I think uh, if I leave anybody with, with a message, it's um, remember the people that believe in you and, and, and believe in yourself because that is what gets you through. Um, because you've got it inside you. All you need is the opportunity. Mm, powerful words. Folks, he is Ty Pennington, obviously a household name. Ty, thank you so much for being here today. I'm just, I'm really just energized by this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, man. You're really awesome. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ty Pennington. Go grab a copy of his new book, Life to the Extreme, over at wintoday.tv. And hey, if today's conversation resonated with you and you know it would help a friend, I want you to text five people right now and share the link to this episode, whether on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google, and encourage them to listen. Well, next week here on the show, I'm joined by John Bevere, and together we're diving into the conversation about what to do when you're doing everything right, yet everything seems to be going wrong. And worse, when it feels like God is nowhere to be found in your situation. Here's a preview. You know, just yeah. say, God, yeah. I just feel like I'm going nowhere. I just yeah. feel like I'm going backwards. So... God and two or three very wise people in your life who know, you know they'll speak the truth. Those are the ones you want to talk to. And then as far as everybody else, how's it going? Fine. It's going fine. Yeah. You know, that's exactly what the Shunammite woman did. You know, when Elisha said, is everything okay? It is well, my, or not Elisha, the servant of Elisha said, is it okay? She said, it's well. It's fine. It's fine. She knew not to talk to him. She knew he was the wrong person for her to say anything to. So she's like, all is well, all is well, all is well. Every, but then she gets to Elisha because she knows this is a man who's wise. He's got answers. And mm. she says, then she, then she brings to him what happened. Next week, John Bevere right here on Win Today. Do not miss it. Hey, many of you are brand new listeners of Win Today. And for that, I just want to say thank you. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now on whichever podcast host you're tuning into. And each and every week, a fresh episode of the show will arrive to you automatically. 
And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, will you take 30 seconds right now to rate and write a review of the show? Doing so helps grow the listenership of Win Today, and that would mean so much to me. Well, hey, until next week, visit me over at wintoday.tv for blog posts and archive podcasts, all aimed at helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.